Wherever I go, I'm constantly asked the question, what are you? <laughs> this doesn't bother me. If I was anyone else, I'd be curious too. A lot of times people go ahead and guess and they say, are you like Puerto Rican? Are you black? I'm never insulted by any of it. Sometimes it's funny and it's pure curiosity. And why would it be insulting to look like another race? So I go ahead and I respond and I say, well, close. I'm black and white and Hispanic. And then if I'm speaking to someone who has only ever been around those of the same culture, I'm asked a follow-up question of how. Because to them, it's kind of a foreign concept that somebody could have all these different parts of the world in them. And so I respond again and I say, well, my dad is black and white. And my mom's mom is Colombian and her dad is Honduran. And they had me. <laughs> I remember when I was about five years old, my mom told me for the first time, she said, you add diversity into any room you walk into. And I get a little older and I hear this a couple more times and I begin to think, wait, colleges love that. <laughs> Diversity has always played a pivotal factor in my life. I've always been surrounded by such colorful groups of people. My family alone has so many people from so many different parts of the world and with so many different parts of the world in them. And I've grown up in the Baha'i community, which in itself is so accepting and loving, and is also made up of every version of human being there is. Now, since I've grown up in the faith, I've also been taught and reminded that ye are the leaves of one tree and the drops of one ocean. And as I got older, I began to see this in action. I've had the privilege of experiencing not only the wonderful feeling of community that diverse environments can bring, but I've also felt the uneasy tension that non-diverse environments can provide. My parents made sure that I understood that not everyone is like me, but that I, just like the Baha'i faith teaches, love regardless. They put me in an elementary school called the Ancona School, and I was there from kindergarten through eighth grade, and it was on the south side of Chicago. And one of Ancona's missions was diversity in education. The learning and teaching there was very hands-on. We learned about the world, but not just geography. We learned about culture and experience and language and what's important to certain people in different parts of the world. And we went on class trips around the country where we were able to independently and fearlessly explore the world around us. And our eighth and final year culminated with a class trip to Oaxaca, Mexico, where we lived with host families that didn't speak English, and we got to explore a city that was all but familiar to us. Now this made me want to be in a colorful world all the time, because how beautiful would it be if we all had something different to bring to the room? It made me want to explore and travel and learn 100 new things a day, and for the most part I was able to, to the best of my ability at that age at least. But while I was at Ancona, I was also training with the Joffrey Academy of Dance. I've been heavily involved in the ballet world now for about nine years. I've trained with schools across the country such as American Ballet Theater in New York City and Boston Ballet, and I've made it to final rounds of the Youth American Grand Prix, which is one of the biggest ballet competitions in the world. Now throughout all this, I've become more aware and conscious of something that the ballet world doesn't like to shine a lot of light on. And that's that there's not much diversity in it, hardly any. Now, history has shown that generally things tend to become more accepting and change over time. But while the overall technique and expectations of ballet have undeniably become more and more demanding and rigorous throughout the years, the overall look of a ballet dancer has been significantly constant. Certain training institutions seem to be almost stubborn in what they expect their ballet dancers to encompass. And it's the worst thing about ballet, and it's the only thing that's been impossible for me to accept. And I've realized it's the environment. It's the type of non-diverse environment that can be diluted with diversity. Why is this? I'm not really sure. I'm only in high school and I haven't really had time to test the psychological process of what happens to people when they're immersed in different cultures every day, but I do have a theory. 
I believe it'll provide a subconscious sense of equality. But how can we change this? How can we change the lack of diversity in the ballet world, or in your colleges and universities, or in your workplaces, or in your kids' schools, or in your cities? Well, one of the pillars of the teachings of the Baha'i faith is unity and diversity. In Chicago, where I'm from, if you're immersed in the arts world, you have an extra option for high school. And that's to attend the only public arts school in the city called the Chicago High School for the Arts. I got in as a dance major, and I'm currently in my senior year. Not only am I constantly immersed in all these different cultures every day, but I'm heavily and simultaneously involved in the arts and academic world. I, along with every student in this, in this school, have had the privilege of experiencing the community that diversity has to offer. Regardless of your race, there becomes a common struggle, and it's impossible for you not to interact with all these different cultures and characters on a daily basis. The minorities in my school were all so proud of where we come from, and we get to talk about our experiences in an open and welcoming environment. And if something has happened in society that angers us as a whole, the entire school gets to vent and decompress because the staff understands how much it really impacts us and how much it may impact our future. Abdul Baha states, it is self-evident that humanity is at variance. Human tastes differ, thoughts, native lands, races, and tongues are many. It is possible, however, for all to become unified through one spirit, just as all may receive light from one sun. And this is how it must start. We must come together regardless of race, religion, language, social class, or gender. We must be kind regardless of one's flaw. We must understand that we are one human family and help teach each other the same thing. Now, it's not an easy thing to do, but there are steps that can be taken towards getting there. And so I challenge you. Starting now, look around you. Look at who's in the room and separate everyone into different categories. Look at how many people represent each social class, or each gender, or each race, or religion, or how many people speak a certain language. Look at these categories and evaluate the ratios. If there's an uneven ratio in a certain category, ask yourself why. And if the reason is unjust, ask yourself how you can change it. And then take actions towards changing it. Now, the writings say that world peace is not only possible, but inevitable. Humans have just made the means of getting there a little more difficult than it has to be. I've seen so many beautiful examples of diversity in my school, or in Chicago, or wherever else I've been, but I haven't seen all that there is, and I can't wait to see what more the world has to offer for me. Throughout this all, I've realized that yes, it is possible for world peace to happen, but it must start with unity and diversity. Thank you.